Now let's look at ways on how you could gain confidence. Now, first of all, I'm going to say is plan. I mentioned conscientiousness. These are goal-oriented people. But the reason why planning things out is good is because a person with a plan, they account for what could happen. And if you plan well, you also account for what may not happen. So you're accommodating both sides. When we talk about anxiety, stress, and worry, it's usually because we're anticipating all these outcomes, but we never anticipate how we're going to address them. We just see the problem. We see no solutions or very few solutions. So if you have a plan, at least gives you the idea, going back to that point of trust. Okay, if I know if this doesn't work, plan A, I trust that I have B and C just in case. So I have something to fall back on because the fear is usually within the unknown. We're, we're usually confident when we know things, but we can't know everything. But we at least can mitigate some of the risk and try to account for the things we can't see ahead of time. Also, we can look at fitness. People always talk about how working out is good for the brain, good for the mind, obviously good for the body. But why would it be good for the body? Let's think about just the simple fact of you're putting yourself under pressure, under stress, whether it be running, lifting weights, jumping, and then you have to accommodate that. You get a little sore, the muscle rebuild when you rest and recover, and you do it again. So you're repeating the cycle of adversity, stressor, overcome, do it again. Adversity, stressor, what does that sound like? The confidence cycle. So you see how this keeps coming full circle. So that self-efficacy, you get more confident in the belief that you can get better shape because now you're seeing results. Now, granted, results won't always come, but this is also why fitness is good because they won't always come. So your brain is getting that reinforcement that if you work hard, you will get result. But sometimes you work hard, you won't get result or it'll be a slower result. So you're indirectly training the brain, training the body to accommodate resistance and stressors, but also reinforcing how the brain factors in how we need to overcome that. Also, when you're doing these fitness, try to do your goals, set them to a reasonable level, but also put it to a point where you know you can overcome it, but also it's straining enough that it's just barely there. The best programs look at the top strength coaches. They're able to accommodate resistance and have that adjustment and adaptability to change and auto-regulate their programs so the client or the lifter, whoever, can get better to the best of their abilities because they know when to tweak it. And the same thing when you're doing fitness to get more confident. You can't just do what you know every day. When I used to work in the fitness industry, I would see gym goers do the same three or four exercises with the same weights or the same miles per hour on the treadmill, whatever it is, they do it over and over. Granted, they got the success that they accomplished the workout, but they did something they knew they could do. They could trust they could finish that workout. But the problem with this is, one, your muscles are adapted. So while you get the actual sweat or fatigue from doing it, because people say, I sweated or I felt sore. There's a difference between working and working hard. You're just working. Your body has to exert energy. The ATP has to break down. That's happening no matter what. But to accommodate, that stressor is not enough. So going to the point, you have to change up the, the workout routine, whether there is adding more intensity, resistance, adding more duration, changing angles or whatever it is to the exercises. So fitness is a great tool and people utilize it, of course, but just know why it's beneficial. And there's obviously neurochemical responses to that. There's also testosterone. You can get a daddy even how that helps with confidence. But the last one I would say is put yourself in social settings. So going back to that extroversion tier, social settings require you to adapt in real time because people who stay to themselves, what's the one constant about that? You're always you. You know what comes out of your brain. So you can't really get surprised by much. Even if you like watch things, yeah, you're getting exposed to other thinking or other mindsets, but it's not the same as being in a real time situation because that requires something called working memory. If you're not familiar with that, that's our ability to hold information short term in real time and manipulate it to be able to relay it back and forth from our long term to our short term to make sense of our environment. In the case of social situations, this is people, this is places, this is the settings around you. So you have to adapt quickly. So that's why being in social situations are good because it's going to help this working memory capacity because everything you're hearing me say is recorded so you can stop it, play it back again. But in a real-time conversation, you don't have that ability. This is where social awkwardness kind of comes in. I talked about this with uh, Dr. Tai Tashiro, but basically you're taking in real-time information. You have to make sense and that cognitive flexibility, that problem solving, that being able to be around people that may not be someone you want to be around. You have to do that. And this is how you build that trust and confidence that you can adapt and adjust. So being in social situations for the most part will put you in an unpredictable field in a manner where you have to carry out things that may not be in your control, but it will also make you have to use the parts of the brains where you're using this working memory, this capacity to be able to take in real-time information. 
So these are just three things. It's not an exhaustive list at all, but it was just three things that can help you gain some confidence 